nice to see. <laughs> I guess it's not as bad as Tuesday. Before we begin, I just want to say thank you. I received a lot of emails from everybody. I'm still in the process of responding to all of them, but I'm happy to know that you guys have a light. And not only do you have a light, some of you guys have some really cool lives. Uh, what was nice is some of you really told me about your hobbies in depth, and you guys got some sweet hobbies. We have climbers, basketball players, Hot Wheels collectors, cross stitchers, everything you can imagine. A lot of Lego, but I don't know if you just buttered me up because you know that's my soft spot. But thank you guys for taking the time to enjoy yourself. School shouldn't be all about just work, work, work. That's if you want to speed run into depression. You don't want to do that. So, oh, thank you. Make sure that you guys always take the time to enjoy yourselves. Number one priority. Today, we are going to do something extremely fun. We're going to change your lives. Well, not really. <laughs> I'm going to show you something called the virtual work method. Virtual work method. If I show up hands, how many of you guys have heard of this method before? That's why I'm not changing your lives. I think Yong already has. As you were going to see, the virtual work method is very unique. It has many applications, many applications. And the application that I'm going to show you today is different than that of Dr. Yong. So even though it sounds like I'm going to be covering the exact same stuff, it's actually going to be different. And this is what we are going to do. Let's say that we have this beam. If I know the elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio, or basically the material properties of this beam, and I know the dimensions, can I figure out my displacements? You guys are saying yes? How? At this point, do you know how to find the displacements? If I give you the geometry, loading, and material properties. OK, how? The answer is you don't yet. You don't know how to find the displacements. That's the magic of today. But let's go to a different thing. If I give you the displacements, can you find the strains? If I give you the displacement function, could you find strains? Could you find stress? Could you determine if it failed? Yes. So that's the magic of today. We talked about this entire course. We've covered everything except for how do we get those displacement functions. And topics three to six are basically midterm number two. I always provided the displacement functions. And with those, you did amazing things. Again, stresses, strains, failure modes, whatever you want. The question becomes, how do we get those displacement functions? In the previous topic, topic seven, we looked at a very specific case of beams. And we said that using Euler-Bernoulli beam assumptions, we can find the displacements through a differential equation. Now, show of hands, how many of you guys enjoyed solving differential equations? Yeah, that's what I thought. Absolutely no one. In simulation software, do you think that we solve a differential equation? Who, who thinks yes? OK, who thinks no? The answer is no. It takes too long. And in reality, it's hard to solve. It becomes really hard to solve. Keep in mind that when we looked at those Euler-Bernoulli beams, they were very simple. They were just rectangular beams. What happens if my beam has a curve in it? Well, it becomes a little bit harder. OK, but what happens if the beam is also inelastic? Well, it becomes even harder. What happens if we start considering second order effects? Well, it becomes even harder. So in general, when we simulate things, we don't want a differential equation. We want to solve things more simply. And by more simply, I mean approximating things. So up until this point, when I gave you guys a beam problem, I always made sure it was simple. It was always a nice distributed load. And that was basically it. Question for you guys. If I give you a beam, let's say that this was my beam, supported on both ends, 
but instead of a distributed loaf, one point loaf, right in the middle. What do you do? Well, we covered Euler Bernoulli beams. When we derived Euler Bernoulli beams, was it derived with a point load in the middle? No. So all that stuff that we did, is it valid? No. In reality, will you come across beams with a point load? Yeah. So we need to start figuring out ways of solving kind of the general case. The second problem that we had is we dealt with beams. Beams under axial load, beams under lateral load. We didn't talk about just general continuums. Let's say that I wanted to simulate this podium. I want to stress it, make sure it doesn't break. Could you use Euler-Bernoulli theory to simulate a podium? No. So that becomes the other thing is how do we have kind of the general sense? Again, we covered beams, but we want to move to the general thing, which is continuums. This right here, you could probably solve as an Euler-Bernoulli beam, but we're going to solve it today as a continuum. As a continuum. So it doesn't matter the shape, anything else, we are going to solve it as a continuum. So that's what I'm going to try and sell you on today. How do we find the displacement function of something if we just know the geometry, the material properties, as well as the loading? That's all we're going to do today. How do we figure out the displacements? Now, it turns out there are many, many methods. We have virtual work, which we're going to cover today. We have the Rayleigh-Ritz method. We have the point collocation method. We have the Gallican method. We have methods galore. The virtual work method, though, luckily for you guys, is the most powerful. I'll tell you guys that right now. It's the most powerful method. When it comes to simulation software, we use approximation methods. But nine times out of ten, the method that is used in those fancy simulation software, virtual work. When I teach finite element method and we kind of derive our equations, we use virtual work. Now, the first thing that we're going to discuss is, well, what is virtual work? No one knows. What does virtual mean? Not real. Not real. So isn't that funny? We're learning something that's essentially not real. It turns out that virtual work is just a math proof. It doesn't come from any lab tests or anything like that. It was just purely a math proof. Now, engineers, we don't like math proofs. It makes no sense to us. So what we did is we added the word virtual to try and make it sound like it's something physical, but it's not. It's just a math proof that when you work it out, it turns out really nice. So today we are going to talk about the principle of virtual work for continuums. Next lecture, we are going to apply it to beams. As we remember beams, we have a lot of simplifications. It becomes rather easy. Right now, we are going to talk about the most general case. Now, I'm going to warn you guys. The math is going to look pretty gross. It's going to be a lot of math that you haven't seen before because, again, this is a very powerful method. But let me remind you, do you need to know the proofs? No. You just need to know the resulting equations. But in this case, they're also pretty bad. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. So we're going to dive in. Principle of virtual work. The problem is, is up until this point, we have used differential equations to get exact solutions. They are exact in terms of their assumptions, but in the end, when we solve a differential equation, we're getting an exact solution. In the real world, we don't really have these nice assumptions all the time. Another thing that we had before was also nice geometry, linear elasticity. It's great. It makes us able to solve those differential equations through Mathematica very simply. Once we start considering the real things of reality, well, it becomes very difficult to solve. So we've already talked about two. We have this equation here, which is for beams under axial load, and we had this equation here, which was for Euler-Bernoulli beams under flexion. And we said, okay, yeah, they're not that hard to solve as long as I know the boundary conditions. But remember, we made a lot of assumptions. So either one of these equations consider Poisson effects. 
No. Do either one of these equations directly consider shear? No. That example that I just showed you guys at the beginning of the lecture, we are going to solve that today considering Poisson effects, considering shear, considering all those things that we neglected before. And again, we do this by approximating the solution using some sort of method. Now, the method today is going to be the method of virtual work. So again, the first key thing I want you guys to take away is that we are now approximating solutions. When we use the method of virtual work, what we basically do is we are going to assume a displacement. We're assuming something. And then we are going to solve for coefficients. Now, whatever we assume is the displacement will kind of be the top. For instance, let's say that the actual behavior of something is a cubic function. Cubic. Kind of goes crazy. But I use a linear approximation. Am I going to have a good approximation? No. So what I would need to do is I would need to go up a level, maybe quadratic, maybe I'll go all the way to cubic. But what becomes the problem with adding more and more terms? What do you guys think? This is what it's going to come down to. Every term you add into your equations becomes an equation you need to solve. So basically, at the end of the day, and we're not going to get into this part, is you get a matrix. And the size of that matrix is the number of coefficients that you need to solve. So if I go from linear, let's say two coefficients, to cubic, four coefficients, <laughs> four, not five, we basically go from two equations with two unknowns to four equations with four unknowns. So the more terms that we add, what's going to happen to your computer program? It's going to slow down. You will find out that even in the virtual work method, if we were to do a cubic function, it's going to take Mathematica a while. I kind of played around with it a bit to try and find a nice example to show you guys. And I did a cube, no, I did a, even a quadratic. And it took maybe five minutes to run. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of time, five minutes. But you've seen how fast Mathematica can solve things. So imagine how complex it must be for Mathematica to take five minutes. And that was considering basically eight terms. When we deal with actual simulation, we don't have eight terms. We have millions. That's why actual simulation programs can take days, if not weeks, to run. So it's something we have to be careful of. So this virtual work method has many applications. The first one is solving reaction forces of determinants or indeterminate structures. The second one is finding displacements at specific points. Does that one sound familiar to you guys? I believe this is what you do in 372. You get a beam or a truss, and you find the displacement at a point. Now, we can do that here, but what we are going to do is we are going to find the approximate displacement functions. So again, something that would separate this class from 372 is we would have a beam loaded, and Dr. Young would say, okay, what's the displacement right here? But I say, what's the displacement everywhere? So that's what we're going to try and do here. So again, this is going to be the key for us, finding these displacement functions. Now, for this method, we are going to utilize what we say is the principle of virtual work. Now, what is the principle of virtual work? It's very simple. The internal virtual work, which I call IVW, is going to be equal to the external virtual work, EVW. That's it. This principle right here will allow us to solve everything we need to do in our structure. Now, it's actually quite magical. How many equations do I have here? One. I see two. I have as many equations as I need. If I have eight unknowns, I can get eight equations from here. If I have a million unknowns, I can get a million equations from here. So this is why the principle of virtual work starts to confuse some students. Because if you look at it, well, it looks pretty simple. It's one equation. But it's actually not. It's many, many equations. And we're going to discuss how exactly we get them. 
But the question is, what is internal virtual work and what is external virtual work? Well, the internal virtual work is going to be our real stresses in our structure multiplied by virtual strains and then integrated over the volume or over the domain of our structure. In the last lecture, when we talked about strain energy, we found the strain energy density U. And in order to go from the density to the total strain energy, did we have to integrate over the domain? Yes. So that's why we kind of do that lecture, because it gets you ready for this lecture. What about the external virtual work? Well, this is going to be our real applied forces multiplied by virtual displacements. So this is, in essence, what we're doing. is We're taking something real when it comes to forces or stresses, and then we're multiplying it by something virtual, strains or displacements. And we're going to see where exactly these come from. So again, we're, today we're going to look at the continuum case, the most general case possible. As we're going to see, the derivation that we're about to do has no assumptions. Even though we are going to apply it to linear elastic materials, it can be applied to inelastic materials. It considers Poisson effects. Plain sections don't have to remain plain. This case that we're going to do, extremely powerful. But it's going to look pretty gross. So are, are you ready? Are you sure? Because it's not going to be pretty. It starts off nice. It, it, it teases you. It starts off nice. It builds your trust. It asks you for a date, and then it doesn't show up because it's mean. You ready? All we're going to do to derive it is two simple steps. That's it. We're going to multiply governing equations by a virtual displacement field, u star. So this is our virtual displacement field. And then we are going to integrate over the domain. That's it. The question first becomes is what is the governing equations? I'll give you a hint. For Euler-Bernoulli beams, it was our differential equation. For beams under axial load, it was that differential equation. But what is our governing equations for a continuum? Just a random plate. Let's say this podium. What equations do I have to describe this podium? Do I have a differential equation? What do you guys think? No. But what must hold true in basically every civil application that we have? The sum of the forces is equal to something. Typically zero. But what is that concept called? Equilibrium. equilibrium. Now, do we have equilibrium equations that we talked about? Yes. So continuums are going to be based on the idea that everything must be in equilibrium. So if we look at our three equations of equilibrium, we have the following. So hopefully these look familiar to you guys. <laughs> Keep in mind that if you were to go through them, it's 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 1. Remember on the midterm, I put 1, 2, and 1, 3, confused everybody. <laughs> but these are going to be our three equations. And basically we have one equilibrium equation for every direction. So for x1, I'm just going to call it the x direction. We have the y direction and the z direction. Instead of saying e1, e2, e3, I feel that students prefer x, y, z. It just makes more sense. So basically, the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Now in this particular case, we are going to do statics. So if we are considering a static case, what is this equal to? Zero. We have no acceleration. And this is what is going to be the basis of everything. So if you look at the steps above, we are going to take our governing equations and we are going to multiply them by a virtual displacement field. So I'm going to take the sum of the forces in every direction and I'm going to multiply it by their displacements. So I have sum of the forces in the x direction times u1 star, or the displacement in the x direction sum of the forces in the y direction multiplied by the displacement in the y direction, and same thing for the z direction. So notice that I have stars here because these are virtual displacements. Now the magic of this equation comes into this fact right here. It's going to be equal to zero. Why is it equal to zero? Well, 
why is this equation equal to zero? If it wasn't equal to zero, we have a whole different equation. But this one's magical because it's equal to zero. But why? Yes, statics. This term right here, the summation of forces in the x direction, well, we said it's equal to zero for static is. So zero multiplied by a displacement is still going to be zero. Same thing for here, same thing for here. So in the end, we have zero plus zero plus zero. It has to equal zero. But this is where everything gets fun. Remember, I told you that this is deceiving. It makes you feel like it's going to be a nice proof. But now it's not. Because we are going to take this equation right here, and we are going to write it in a compact form. And this is where we are going to do all of our derivations. So this is our equation for virtual work in its most raw form. Now we have to manipulate it to make it more user-friendly. First thing I'm going to do is not related to this equation. It's more off-topic. But I'm going to look at this right here. So again, this isn't really from here. This is just a proof. If I take the derivative of two functions multiplied by each other and use product rule, I get the following. You guys remember product rule? You take the derivative of one thing, times it by the other, and then add it to the other thing, multiply by the derivative. Yes? Perfect. And you're saying, well, okay, Clayton, but well, this didn't really appear in here at all. So why are you doing this? Well, if I rearrange it for this term right here, I get the following kind of equality. Now this is nice because this term right here, this does appear up here. So what I basically did is I did product rule in reverse to get an expression for this term, and I'm going to substitute it into my equation above, which gives me the following equation. Now again, I told you, this looks like garbage. I just made it look somewhat worse, but we're getting there. Next thing we are going to do is we are just going to take this term right here, which was negative, and we are just going to flip it over to the other side to get this expression right here. Now, it doesn't look like it, but this is actually a virtual work equation. Remember, we said that external virtual work is equal to internal virtual work. It doesn't look like it yet, but this is actually our external virtual work, and this is our internal virtual work. But how many of you guys want to use this equation? No? No takers? Good. Because this equation is garbage. No one wants to use that equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify it even further, and we are going to look at this side right here. So far, we have simply this term. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the idea that sigma is symmetric. Sigma is symmetric. Now, you guys are saying, well, hold on, please. Symmetric, I thought you said there was no assumptions. Is assuming our stress symmetric a decent assumption for a general case? What do you guys think? We proved it together. We said that sigma will always be symmetric unless we consider one thing. Do you guys remember what that one thing was? No? Uh, that's okay. I don't blame you. It was not really tested. Moments. Moments. When we did our derivations, we didn't consider moments. Now, the nice thing in reality is there isn't really those internal moments unless you deal with magnetism or biomedical, something like this. So the idea of saying that this is symmetric is still a very valid thing to do. So we're going to say that this is symmetric, which leads to the following expression. I can replace this with 1 half of sigma ij plus sigma ji. Now, if it's symmetric, are these two terms equal to each other? Yes. So all I did here, even though it seems counterintuitive, was I say, OK, over here, let's say I have x. Well, on this side, I have x plus x, 2x, divided by 2, x. So it's one of those things, again, seems counterintuitive, makes it look like I'm making more work for myself, but this is really nice. Because I can take this term then, and multiply it by these two to kind of get this expression right here. And then the last thing, which you guys all agreed on, if sigma is symmetric, these two terms are the same, correct? So if I have an expression, can I factor both of these two terms out of the expression? If they're the same. 
Yes. So I factor these two terms out because it's symmetric, sigma ij one half, and then I get this right here. Does this look familiar to you guys? One half of a displacement gradient plus the transpose of a displacement gradient? No? I'm hoping so. Strain. That right there, that's our strain tensor. So this right here all simplifies to the following. We have sigma ij multiplied by epsilon ij star, or virtual strain. And if you look back to the beginning of the lecture slides, that's what I said internal virtual work was. It was our real stresses multiplied by our virtual strains. Very nice. Now I'm going to give you guys one little tip. Please don't make this mistake. When we dealt with strain energy last lecture for a continuum, we assumed linear elasticity. And we got an expression that looked almost identical to this, but we had one half. You guys remember last lecture? Is there a one half here? No. So don't use one half. That is because we assumed linear elasticity. Have I assumed linear elasticity yet? No. I haven't made really any assumptions besides that sigma was symmetric, but we've already proved that that's generally the case no matter what happens. So this is going to be good. So this right here, we kind of leave this alone. This is going to be our internal virtual work after we integrate. What about this side over here? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm now going to do the integration. Remember, the first thing I said we do is we take our governing equations, multiply them by a virtual displacement. That's been done. As we can see, we have a virtual strain, virtual displacement, virtual displacement. And I said the second step was integrating over the domain, basically getting that total energy. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate every term over the domain. So this is the same as integrating over the volume. Again, I want to find that total energy. So now we're going to look at the other side, the left-hand side. If this is the internal virtual work, what is this equal to? If this is internal virtual work, what should this be You're over here? External virtual work. Do you guys know how to use this equation? No. So let's try and make it into something more manageable. We're going to look at this term right here. I'll be honest, this term, this kind of stays the same. We don't do too much to that term. This right here, if we have the partial derivative of two functions multiplied by each other, this is the same as saying that it's actually the divergence of those two functions. Now, again, this is where the math makes no sense to you guys. We didn't talk about divergence theory, anything like that. So you're just going to have to trust me. Okay? What's nice is if we have something that's classified as divergence, we can use divergence theorem, which basically allows me to take an integral over a volume and transform it into a surface integral, or an integral over a surface. So I went from a volume over here to now a surface over here. And as we can see, the formula got rearranged. We have sigma ij times ui star, virtual displacement, dotted with nj. So this is the normal vector defining a surface. So I'm hoping you guys see where this is going. I now have a stress tensor dotted with a normal vector. Have we done something like that before? Yes. So this is where all the magic starts happening. Now, sigma was sigma ij. So if I have sigma ji, what is that essentially? If I, if typically it's ij, but now I have ji, is that just the transpose? So in essence, if I look here, I have sigma transpose dotted with n. What was that? Do you guys remember? Sigma transpose times n. No? Traction vector? You guys remember traction vectors? So we know that sigma is symmetric, therefore we can rearrange this to the following. And now right here we have sigma times n, which we know it's just going to be our traction vector, Tn. So from there, it simplifies into the following, which makes sense, because when we look at traction vectors, they act over surfaces. 
So this would be our equation over here. And I can substitute it. And this is my final expression. This is the virtual work for continuums. As we can see, we have a traction vector uh, dotted with uh, virtual displacements integrated over a surface. We have rho b, which, what is rho b? What is rho b? Body forces. Body forces. Do they act over a surface or a volume? Volume. volume. That's why we have a volume integral. And then at the other side, we have the summation of sigma ij times epsilon star ij in every direction. So this is kind of the same as before when we talked about energy, every direction. That's why we have a summation. And then integrated over the domain as well. So this side over here is our external virtual work. And that side is our internal virtual work. Now, who wants to use this equation? No one. But there is no more simplification. That's what we have to use. Who's excited? No? I find that this topic is the most confusing to students. And I'll be honest, it's the hardest. If I were to give this to my grad students right now, they're going to be giving me the same look you guys are giving me. Some of you guys look mad at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to teach it though. It's a nice topic because again, it's really powerful. So the next lecture, we're going to talk about virtual work when it comes to beams. Beams had a lot of simplification. So do you think that for beams, it's going to look nicer? Yes. So I'll tell you guys this right now. In an exam type scenario, I will ask you about virtual work for beams. I will not ask you for virtual work for continuums. In my opinion, this right here is more of a graduate level topic. I'm telling you guys that now. I can ask you a little bit about the theory, try and trick you with that, but I'm not going to ask you guys to solve. We are going to do an example, and as you're going to see, it's going to take forever because this process isn't quite simple. We have a lot of terms and a lot of things that you guys don't know. Remember, I said the whole goal today is to solve for displacement functions using this equation. I give you guys the equation. You guys know the goal, solve for displacement. How many of you guys can take this and solve for displacements right now? No one. This is why it becomes very hard. So let's talk about, OK, we have this equation, but how do we solve our actual displacements? Well, what we have to do is we have to make an approximate solution. We have to look at a problem, and we, as engineers, have to determine, OK, how should this behave? So what we would typically do is we would select a polynomial to describe the behavior. So what I would do is I'd look at that table and say, OK, I've got a point load. Is it going to behave linearly? Well, probably not. If I were to deflect it, I'm at least expecting a parabola or something like that. So I would pick an approximate displacement function that is at least quadratic. So for a continuum in two dimensions, I would have kind of a fold. Now, if you look at this, again, it's a polynomial. So we have a constant plus x1 plus x2 plus x1, x2, and so on. And it's up to us as engineers, OK, where do we stop? Maybe I'm just interested in this part right here. Maybe I need more terms, so I add all these terms. But again, the key here is the coefficients a and B, they're unknown. So that's the whole goal of virtual work, solving for these unknown coefficients. Let's say that A and B, I knew all of them, and they were numbers. Well, then do I have the displacement? Yes. It would just be a function. All of your displacement functions are a function of x1 and x2. So that's all I'm trying to do here. I want to solve for all of these unknown coefficients using the method of virtual work. So in general, more terms, better approximation. But as we've already discussed, the more terms you add, the harder it's going to be. Because every term you add, you have another coefficient, which is another equation you have to solve for. So it gets really bad. And the goal, using a virtual work method, is to solve for all of these coefficients. So in the example we're going to do by hand, we are going to do kind of a half linear approximation 
And then when we cover this in Mathematica, we'll go further on. As you're going to see, it becomes harder and harder the further we go. So to do this, we are going to use the method of virtual work. So when we do these approximation methods, step number one, you're going to make it an approximation displacement function. Now typically in this class, I'll give you what I want it to be, but this is what you have to do in general. And then after you need to solve using virtual work. But there's one key thing, and I'm hoping you guys are listening, because this will get every student. Before we use virtual work, we have to apply our boundary conditions. As you guys remember, when we solve for coefficients of our differential equation, we use boundary conditions. That allowed us to solve for some of the constants. It's going to be the same here. We use something called essential boundary conditions. This is going to be a very important role when it comes to beams. But here's the thing. For continuums, the only boundary condition which we consider essential is displacement. Displacement. There's no moment. There's no shear. There's no rotation boundary condition. For continuums, it's purely displacement. Now, you may be saying, Clayton, I don't know what you mean. Let's say that I have a plate, and this is actually kind of what we're solving for later today. And let's say that it is fixed at this end. For a continuum, that basically means that all the points along the surface cannot move in the x or y direction. If I know that these points cannot move, can I immediately solve for some of these coefficients? What do you guys think? If I know the displacement here must be 0, can I immediately solve for some of these coefficients without virtual work? Yes. So again, that's the first thing you do, essential boundary conditions. Let's say that I use a linear approximation to describe this plate. Again, we know at this location where x1 is equal to 0, the displacement must be 0. So all I would do is look at a couple points. If I were to look at this point, x1 is 0, x2 is also 0, well, then my approximation function is just a naught b naught. What is the displacement at this point? Zero. So if this is equal to zero, what does a naught and b naught have to be? Zero. Same thing if I were to look at this point up here. If I were to look at this point up here, so x1 is still zero, but x2 is, let's say, h. Well, then I get a2 times h and b2 times h. And if this is equal to 0, what do a2 and b2 have to be? 0. So right away, I just solved for four of these coefficients based on my boundary conditions. That's going to be the first goal. It's going to come even bigger in uh, beams. So that's kind of the first thing. So again, the virtual work method, general steps, assume an approximate displacement vector polynomial. So if I wanted, let's say, a 2D linear approximation, it would be as follows. Goal is to solve a, a i and b i, and then solve for essential boundary conditions, which we just talked about. But now the question is this. <clears throat> After all my essential boundary conditions are applied, do I still have unknown coefficients? Yes. So the question is, is how do we solve those remaining ones. Well, that's where we get into virtual work. Now, in this case right here, this approximate displacement, this is considered our real displacement. Our real displacement. We're saying that our plate or beam or whatever actually abides by this. When it comes to virtual work, though, do we deal with real displacements or virtual displacements? Virtual. virtual. So what we need to do is we need to take our real displacements and convert them to virtual displacements. You think that'll be easy or hard? Who thinks it's going to be easy? Who thinks it's going to be really hard? It's going to be really easy. To go to actual displacements, the virtual displacements, all we're going to do is replace these coefficients with virtual coefficients. So if this is my approximate real displacements, my virtual ones is going to be the exact same thing. I just added stars to every one. As you can see, stars. That's it. 
So that's what we're going to do. And for virtual work, we are going to utilize this right here. Because if I now know you star, I can find a lot. Before we get into the next slide and show you guys, let's just talk about it. If I know virtual displacements, I have my two functions. Can I find virtual strains? Yes. How? And when we talked about strain, we never talked about virtual strain, so how would I find virtual strains? Same way. Exactly the same way. So say, okay, now that I have my virtual displacements, I can find my virtual strains using the same methodology as before. So I say, okay, I have my virtual displacement functions. Well, then I can find my virtual displacement gradients. And then I can find my virtual strain tensor. That's nice and simple. We're going to talk about it kind of at the bottom here. But when we look at internal virtual work, we needed two things. Virtual strain, which we now have, and real stresses. Well, virtual strains wasn't too bad. How do I find real stresses? No one knows? This is where it gets fun. Remember, in the previous slide, we have two functions. We have a real one and a virtual one. We just used the virtual function to find strain. Can we use our real function to find stresses? If I know the real displacements, can I find the real stresses? Yes. It's the same as above, just an extra step. We can use, or we can find our stress tensor using our approximate displacement vector. So if I know that approximate displacement vector from the previous slide, well, I can find the displacement gradients. I can find the strain tensor. Again, same as above, but I can take it a step further and then find the stresses using whatever constitutive relationship we have. So this is where it starts to become really fun. Now, at this point, we have to take a step back and look at what we did, because I just put the formulas. Both our virtual and our real displacement vectors, do we know them exactly? Or are they full of unknowns? They're full of unknowns. So what you're going to see is this is going to be full of unknowns, and it's going to be full of those virtual unknowns. This right here is also going to be full of unknowns, but this is going to be full of those real unknowns. Remember, we want to solve for the real unknowns. So now that I know both of these, I can solve for the internal virtual work using the following formula. Do I know what sigma ij is? Yes, we just solved it. What about epsilon ij? Yes, we just solved it. So all I have to do is sum them together and then integrate over the domain. So again, if I were to have a rectangle, I'm just integrating over every direction. That's it. So this actually here isn't too bad because there's no unknowns. We can find the internal virtual work. It's going to be a function of many unknowns, but we can actually solve for it. So if this was the case, this right here, this expression, would be a function of a1 star, a3 star, b1 star, b3 star, b1, b2, etc. So now we have to go to the other side, external virtual work. We have this equation right here. Now, do you think that we know everything in this equation? We didn't really talk about this equation. What do you think? Do we know everything in here? Yeah. If we were to look, it's basically comprised of two things. This right here we said is body force. So that'd be something like gravity. Try to pull something up. <coughs> gravity pulls it down. So does it does this equation account for gravity? So if I were to tell you guys in a question, consider self-weight. Do you know where in this equation to consider self-weight? Yeah. You would just set this as gravity. Virtual displacements, we know what it is, so you just have to integrate over the volume. But when we design structures, is gravity the only force we design for? No, we design for loads. Typically, we design for uniformly distributed loads. Now, if I were to load this, 
Am I applying a load over the volume or over the surface of this beam? Surface. So the load that I apply is just going to be an attraction vector. And then I integrate that over the surface. Is the traction vector force or stress? Traction vector. Force or stress? Stress. Stress. So if I were to integrate stress over an area, what essentially am I doing? I'm just getting force. I'm finding the amount of force that I apply. It's the same thing over here. This right here is gravity, which we know acts over the volume. So when I multiply by the volume, I get force. I'm basically just finding the summation of forces throughout my structure. When we do the example, this will make more sense. But in essence, we don't have any unknowns. This equation comes directly from the loads applied to my body. If I had a load coming, let's say, this way, downwards, and then I had a second load pushing to the side, it's the same equation, we'll just have two different traction vectors. We have one for this surface, and then we'll have one for this surface. That's all we're doing. So after that, if we already solved for the internal and external virtual work, well, then we can go to our principle of virtual work, which says they must be equal. But at this point, how many unknowns do we have? At this point, we have eight, assuming that function that we did. We had four virtual and four real, but one equation. So this is why I find virtual work starts to confuse the most students. We have one equation, eight unknowns. Okay, here's the beauty of it right here. We can rearrange this equation so that the virtual coefficients are factored out. You will see that I can express this equation in terms of the virtual coefficients because they'll never be multiplied by each other. What does this mean? It means I can take this equation and write it in the following form. Something, something, something times a1 star plus something, something, something times a2 star all the way through on both sides. I'll never have a1 star times b1 star, ever. It'll just be something, something, something times a1 star, something, something, something times a2 star, etc. And the something, something, something those will be our actual unknowns, A1, A3, B1, B3. Inside of here will never be any virtual unknowns. So if this is the case, should this right here be equal to this over here? Yes. So there's an equation. Should this right here be equal to this over here? Yes, there's another equation. So basically, we just repeat this process because we know these are equal, those are equal. And if we do this one, two, three, four times, well, then we have four equations. How many real coefficients did we have? Four. Four equations, four unknowns, we can then solve. Equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four. Our virtual coefficients, if I were to analyze this, a1 star on both sides, it cancels out. We can solve for every one of those coefficients. So we can then solve for a1, a2, b1, and b2. Once I know a1, a2, b1, and b2, I have my approximate displacement function. I have everything I need. Because if I have my displacement function, can I solve for strains? What do you guys think? If I know my displacements, can I then solve for strains? Yes. Can I solve for stresses? Failure modes? Are you sure? I can solve for anything. The world is now in your hands. This is exactly what software does. We're going to talk about it later on, but one of you guys, I know for sure, has already tried the bonus assignment. But let me ask you a general question. Have any of you played with finite element software? No? One of the key things that will ask you guys in every simulation is what do you want your elements to be? Linear, quadratic, cubic? And it's the key to your simulation. What that is asking you essentially is how many terms do you want in your approximation? That's all it is. 
Isn't that crazy? If I were to scroll all the way down, right here, and I were to tell a software that I want a linear approximation, this is what it's going to assume is the displacement function. If I say I want a qubit, it's going to add more terms, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of the first beautiful thing about virtual work and why we use it so much in our actual simulations. Yes? Why? Is, is this, like if you had 3D, would you have an extra one? Yes. I did it in 2D to kind of make it simple, which is why I said 2D. But yes, for 3D, we would just have C0, C1, C2, and that would be the third direction. Yes. That would be really mean to test you on three directions. But yeah, that's all we do. Now again, it's pretty hard to see, so let's do an example. Now the example I'm going to do today is not on E-class. The reason why is the E-class examples came from Dr. Salmon, and he made his examples find the internal virtual work, find the external virtual work, which is great, but he never showed how to solve for the coefficients. So that's why we are going to do an example together. At the beginning of the lecture, I said, is this something that you would see in reality, you guys said yes. <clears throat> so let's see if we can solve for its displacement. Now in the question, I told you guys, assume this is the displacement function. So again, the, the approximation is something that we as engineers pick. Is this a good approximation? What do you think? No, this is pretty garbage. Is it considered shear? Who thinks it considers shear? No one? Who thinks it does consider shear? It considers shear. Because in my u1 direction, my horizontal direction, it is a function of x2. So it can support shear. But let's just see what happens. So we are given the two material properties, 200,000 MPa, Poisson's ratio 0.3, B, which is the thickness into the page, one meter, and then we're given our beam rates here. Another thing that we were given that I forgot was this is 200 MPa. And then the last thing is that we also have plane stress. Will plane stress make a difference? Do we even need to worry about plane stress? I fooled you. Of course we do. How do you think we find stresses? <laughs> Got you all. Yeah, I know. Laugh at me. <laughs> all right. So would this be something that you can encounter in real life? Yes. Wouldn't it be sweet if we can simulate this just by doing some hand calculations? Yes, it would be great. So remember, all we're doing is virtual work. But I said, once we have our approximation function, we have to do one key thing before we do the virtual work. Do you remember what that was? Boundary conditions. This is fixed at the left-hand side. So we know that that's going to impact some of these terms. So I'm going to come down here. Step number one is our approximation function, which we have. Step number two is our essential boundary conditions. Question for you guys really quick, because this gets the graduate students every time. Why is my essential boundary conditions for continuums just displacement and not rotation? What do you think? I didn't quite hear you, so I'm not too sure what you said, but let's just consider this. Can this edge rotate? No. But do I need to consider rotation? What do you think? Am I making a bad assumption by disregarding rotation? Who thinks I should consider rotation? All right. Let's say that my pencil was that edge. 
And let's say that I take the top points and the bottom points, and I prevent it from translating. Not rotating, translating. Can this rotate? No. Because if I were to look at a rotation, do these top points translate? Yes. So if I restrict them from translating, can this physically rotate? No. I don't consider rotation, but indirectly I kind of do. Because if I were to fix every point, how could it actually translate? It's one of those things that when you get into software, a lot of graduate students like to specify that that edge can't rotate. And the software laughs at them and says, okay, sure, but we don't consider it anyway. <laughs> so it's one of those really funny things. So central boundary conditions. We know that right now, our plate has the following approximation, and we can see that it is fixed along the point where x1 is equal to 0. This whole surface here, actually that pink and purple are kind of the same. Let's switch to blue. This whole surface here is along x1 is equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to write my approximation function, ua, when x1 is equal to 0, and this will be equal to a0. The second term was a1x1. Well, x1 is 0, so that's going to be 0. Plus a2, x2. And then we have b0 plus b2, x2. So from here, we substitute points along x2, because now we have it as a function of x2. The first point I'm going to look at, so I'm just going to erase this line, is I'm going to look at, oops, wrong blue, this point right here, where x1 is equal to 0, but x2 is also equal to 0. So I'm going to come down here and say, okay, we have ua... When x1 is equal to 0, x2 is equal to 0, and we know that this is going to be equal to a0 and b0. Again, x2 is equal to 0. And if I were to go up and look at this point, can that point move horizontally or vertically? So what should the displacement of that point be? Zero. So I can come down here and say, okay, this point has to be equal to zero. Because remember, this is the displacements. We know the displacements must be equal to zero. So if I were to do this, what is A naught and B naught? Zero. So A naught and B naught are equal to zero. If I were to do the exact same, well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and just modify this. So in this current equation, we had a naught, b naught. We can get rid of them. But I got more points along that surface. So I'm going to go back up to the surface. And let's consider this point up here. At this point, we're going to say that x2 is equal to the height, which was equal to 1 meter. So x2 is equal to 1. So I'm going to come back down and say, okay, I'm now worried about my approximation function. Again, x1 is equal to 0, but now x2 is equal to 1. And if we were to look at our approximation function in pink, we have a2 times x2. Well, x2 we said is 1. And then we have b2 times x2, well, x2 again is 1. And if we were to look at that point, can that point displace in either direction? No. So the displacement at that point must also be equal to 0. So what can I say about a2 and b2? They're both equal to 0. That's the only way this equation holds. a2 times 1 is equal to 0. a2 has to be 0. I'll scroll up a little bit. So now we have a2 
D2 is equal to 0. So that's the first step of virtual work, and as you'll see, also the rayleigh ritz method, applying these essential boundary conditions. So now I'm going to come up, I'm going to take my equation, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to come down, and I'm going to paste it, and we are going to just basically update this. So in this equation, a a naught that was zero, b naught zero. We said that a two is also zero, and then b two is also zero. So this is my updated approximation. Is this a good approximation function? Do you think? If I want the true behavior of this plate, do you think it's just going to be linear? No. But this is the only thing we can really do by hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase the brackets. And we'll write it down together. So right now we have A1. Oops, that's the wrong shade. Which Is it this one? All right, perfect. A1, X1, B1, X1. So now we got to figure out how do we solve for A1 as well as B1. Well, the first step in the actual virtual work part of it is creating our virtual displacement approximation. So create virtual displacement function. And it's simple, because if we know that our current approximation, which is equal to a1x1, b1x1, in order to make it virtual, all I have to do is just switch the coefficients to virtual coefficients. So all I'm going to do is just copy this. I'm going to paste it, because it's again going to be the exact same thing. But all I'm going to do, and I'll do this in, let's do it blue. I'm just going to add star. Is that so bad? No, not too bad at all. So say, OK, perfect. Now I need to solve for the internal virtual work. The internal virtual work was a function of two things, real stresses and virtual strains. So what I need to do is I need to use these two displacement functions that I have. So again, remember, this is, and I'm putting in quotes, the real, and this is virtual. And I'm going to use these two displacement functions to actually solve for our stresses and strains. So I'm going to come down here, and we're going to start off. What color do you guys want? How's this? That's pretty good. We'll go with virtual strains. And we know that if we have a displacement function, can we find the displacement gradient? Yes. From the displacement gradient, can we find the strain tensor? So that's all we're going to do. We have our functions. I can say that nabl u star, it's my virtual displacement gradient, is going to be a matrix. So let's see how much you guys remember. What would the first component be? Remember, this right here is going to be, this component is going to be the displacement function 1 differentiated with respect to x1. So it's going to be a1 or a1 star. Which one's it going to be? a1 star. Remember, for virtual strains, we are dealing with virtual displacements. So this right here is going to be a1 star. What's the second component going to be over here? What's the second component going to be? What's the differential of this first component with respect to x2? Zero. zero. So zero. What about this component? Zero. 
The differential of this with respect to x1. B1 star. And then this one's going to be 0. So now that we have this, we can find our virtual strain tensor because it's going to be 1 half of nab u star plus nab u star transpose. So if you were to throw all of this in, you're going to get A1 star, 0 0.5 B1 star, 0 0.5 B1 star, and 0. So let's take a look at this. We are reporting strains in the horizontal direction. We are reporting some shear strains. But is there any strain in the vertical direction? If this is my strain tensor, does this say that there's going to be some strain in the vertical direction? What is epsilon 2, 2? Zero. So is there strain? No. If we were to come up and look at this, do you think, of course, in Euler Bernoulli, there is also none, but in reality, do you think that there would be? Yes. So is this approximation method good? It's the same garbage as Bernoulli. But it is good. Remember, we assumed this. If we added more terms, so let's say we have an A3, X1, X2. Will I get strain in the vertical direction? Yes. So this is something that, again, we as engineers have to start using our own judgment. If I were to do this actual simulation by hand, and I were to get to this point, I'd probably say, well, you know what? I probably should update my virtual or my approximation. I'm not going to, of course, because that would take forever. I picked this one because it's simple and easy to write down. When it comes to Mathematica, it starts to get really, really long and gross. But we're going to forget that. So we have our virtual strains. The second thing we need for internal virtual work is going to be our real stresses. How do we go from displacement to stresses? I have my displacements. What, what can I do with that? Displacement gradient. What can I do with that? Strain tensor. What can I do with that? Stress tensor. If I were to look up at these two things that we have for real and virtual, are the real ones and the virtual ones basically the exact same, with the only difference being the star? So if I were to say, if I want my real stresses, Do you think that my real stress tensor would be the exact same as this one above, just without the stars? Yes. So that's what's nice. When you're doing this in Mathematica or whatever you want to do it in, you just take your code and you basically copy it and post it down here. So from here we can go straight into our real strains. We just have to take away all the stars. But again, we're not after real strains. We're after real stresses. So I'm just going to come down. And we say, OK, this is when we utilize that the question said plane stress. Because if we know the plane stress, we can then figure out what our stress tensor is going to be. So I'm going to come down here. Uh, should I just make it a new page? Yeah, because I need to post this <laughs> for you guys later. So we remember that the relationship between strain and stress for plane stress was first our strain vector. So if we come up here, our strain vector, the component 1, 1 is simply just A1. The component 2, 2 is 0. 
and then the component 3, 3, or, or 1, 2, sorry, the, the shear, is going to be 2 times epsilon 1, 2, which is 0 0.5. We just get this as B1. And this, of course, is going to be equal to 1 over E. I'm just writing the relationship for plane stress. It's right from the, the lecture notes. 1, negative nu, 0, negative nu, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then 2 multiplied by 1 plus nu. And then this is multiplied, of course, by our stresses. So you have sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 1, 2. Again, this just comes directly from plane stress. Do we know what E and nu are? Yes. But more importantly, does the method of virtual work consider Poisson effects? Yes. Isn't that nice? We're starting to get rid of all those assumptions. Now, what will happen is you'll have to take this constitutive law in Mathematica, inverse it to the other side, and you can solve for these three as a function of A1 as well as B1. So I'm just going to come down here and do it. We're going to have, sorry, here. no, I don't want to paste anything. Sigma is equal to, and it gets really, really messy. Well, not messy, just a lot of zeros. <laughs> so if I miss a zero, uh, who cares? You guys know I'm just showing you the process. It's not so much about the numbers. Four more. One, two, three, four, divided by 91. So this times A1. And then we have, what, six million? Divided by 91 times A1. And then we have 1 million times B1. So this is where it starts to get fun. Notice that our real stresses are a function of A1 and B1. And our virtual strains are a function of A1 star, B1 star. Because now that I know both of them, I can go into the actual virtual work. The internal virtual work is going to be equal to the integral over the domain of the summation of i comma j equals 1 to 3 of sigma ij times epsilon ij star over the domain. Now, here's something that doesn't really apply to this situation, but I want you guys to be aware of it. In this equation, we used plane stress. Plane stress. Is epsilon 3, 3, 0 in plane stress? No. Why didn't I calculate it? because it doesn't matter. If we were to look at this equation, it goes back to the same. When it comes to epsilon 3, 3, I'm multiplying it by sigma 3, 3. For plane stress, what is sigma 3, 3? Zero. So I can't calculate it, but you end up with a whole lot of nothing. So and this is the case, this will not be too bad at all. If I were to come up, we say, OK, I have sigma 1, 1, 2, 2, and 1, 2. And if I were to look right here, I have epsilon 1, 1, as well as 1, 2. So there's only going to be two real terms. So I'm going to come down here, and we're just going to do the summation. Oops. So the summation is going to be equal to sigma ij, or sigma 1, 1, which is, <laughs> let's just say, to make it more fun for now, because I don't want to keep writing this, this is equal to uh, what coefficients do you guys want? Alpha, alpha A1, 
alpha A1 and then beta B1. So if we look here, we have alpha A1. So that's from sigma 1, 1. And then this has to be multiplied by our virtual strain, epsilon star 1, 1, which is A1 star. A1 star. And then plus 2, 2. Well, we have an epsilon 2, 2. But do we have a virtual strain 2, 2? No. So we can get, ignore that. We have a shear virtual strain, though, of 0 0.5 V1. And we also have an actual stress of beta B1. So plus beta B1 times B1 star. And then this is what's inside of here. So the last thing we have to do is we have to integrate it, which leads me to your assignment question. A lot of students at said, Clayton, I got the ratio right for the strain energy, but I'm getting the wrong expressions. Chances are you didn't integrate it. Remember, this right here that we calculated, this is essentially the density. This is the energy per unit volume. Yes? Should it be 0.5? Yes, it should be. Thank you for... Perfect. 0 0.5. So this is kind of the energy per unit volume. We have to convert it to the actual volume. Yes? Sorry, can you scroll up? I just want to look at the alphas. Um, why did you say that they're equal? Like oh, yeah, they're not. But the only reason why is because we don't use sigma 2, 2. <laughs> so I didn't really care. But you, you're right. Yeah, no. Good, good call. We'll put gamma. So again, you want to integrate this. Now, the integration always seems really bad, but all we have to do is just look at the dimensions of our actual thing. So all I'm going to do is just have three integrals. I'm going to put our function in between. So I'm just going to call it f of x. I'm going to rewrite it nicer because we have to carry this next lecture. And this is going to be with respect to dx1, dx2, d x3. So if I were to go up and look at dx1, horizontal direction, what are my integration limits? Zero to two. Zero to two. What about the vertical direction? Zero to one. What about the in-depth direction? Zero to one. Zero to one. See? Nice and simple. This is zero to two, zero to one, 0 to 1. Now, I know that you guys don't really want to have to do this. That's why we throw it all into Mathematica, which we'll cover in the next lecture. The last thing I'm going to leave you with isn't really related to this. It's related to why we need to approximate things. This integral here becomes a real pain in the ass. Because, again, I'm integrating the volume. Our shapes thus far have been rectangles. But what happens if I give you this shape right here? Who's going to integrate that? No one. That's why if you look at finite element software, that simulation software, what we do is we take our shape and we split it into little pieces. So if you look at the shape in the finite element software, it'll be something like this. Because can you guys integrate a rectangle? So if you were to just integrate each little rectangle separately and then add them together, good to go? Yeah. Of course, you don't want to do that by hand, but in a computer, it does it all for you. So that's why we actually split things up in finite element, because we don't want to have to keep doing this. It's actually a lot of fun things you can do in finite element where you don't even need to integrate, which is beautiful, but it's secrets for another time. All right, so we'll continue this example next lecture, and I'll clean this up a bit. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful weekend.